Would you take God's word this morning and open, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want to read verse um, 17 down to verse 23. Would you stand for the reading of God's word, please? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there also must be heresies among you, that they which are approved might be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, that is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you so much. You may be seated. May God bless us as we go to his word today. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the privilege of worship. Lord, would you please bless us as we go to the word, open our eyes and our heart to receive truth and apply it, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. For several weeks, we've been doing a series on spiritual disciplines, and the theme verse for the series, as you know, is 1 Timothy 4, 7, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And to spiritual disciplines, as we've been trying to impart to you, or help you to see our disciplines that we regularly practice both personally and corporately to help us promote spiritual growth in our life. And basically, there are godly habits that we have to instill in our own life as we pursue sanctification in the Christian life. So far, we have uh, defined spiritual disciplines. We also looked at the discipline of Scripture, and we looked at the discipline of prayer. And today, I want us to consider the discipline of the Lord's Supper. Now, some might not consider the Lord's Supper to be a discipline per se, but it is a necessary part of the spiritual exercise that a believer needs to have as we grow in Christ. This is a special time, I think, that the Lord can use in our life to help us in this process of sanctification. And so it's a holy time. In fact, one of the words that's been used in church history to speak about the Lord's Supper is the word sacrament, which uh, can mean uh, something that is uh, sacred or holy, something that is set apart. And, uh, and I think that uh, that idea there is uh, sometimes they use that uh, in a wrong way to say that the Lord's Supper has a saving element to it. It does not save anyone, but yet it has a sanctifying element to it in that it helps us in this process of sanctification. And the Lord's Supper is a monumental issue it's been an issue in the history of the church. Uh, Protestants and Catholics have, have spilled a lot of ink over this issue, more than the issue of justification by faith, more than the authority of Scripture. In fact, in the history of the church, there have been men who have been martyred over this doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Think about that. Men who have been put to death. You don't die for something that's not important. This is an important doctrine. And you compare that to today, where a lot of people kind of look at the Lord's Supper as something that's, you know, it's, it's a nice little thing that you do. It's really not necessary, as some people think. Less than 20% of Baptist churches have communion more frequently than four times a year. So it's almost uh, not really treated as if it's that important or regular. And some of the reasons pastors give for not practicing this regularly, I've, I've, I've read where some said, well, I don't want to appear Catholic or I don't want to give it too much familiarity, that way it'll lose its uh, meaning. Or some have said, I don't want to give up sermon time, was another reason why some pastors don't practice it regularly. But all those things demonstrate that 
I think there's a failure to really understand the value of this and the significance of it. So what I want you to see today are just five reasons why it's so important and why we need to incorporate this in our spiritual life. Here's the first reason. Number one, it satisfies the desire of Christ. Why do we do the Lord's Supper? Because this is what the Lord Jesus wants. This is his desire. In Luke 22, verses 14 to 20, at the first Lord's Supper, Jesus said, I greatly desire to share this moment with you, talking to his disciples. In verse 15, he said this, with fervent desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. Jesus wanted to meet with his disciples. He wanted to share that moment. Now, that was the first Lord's Supper, but it was a Passover meal that was, that was changed into the Lord's Supper. And this is how it came about. At that last supper meal, when Jesus was meeting with his disciples, they met in an upper room, and they were worshiping, the, uh, they were observing the Passover meal. We understand the Passover, but let me just give it to you real quickly. You remember that the children of Israel were in bondage to the Egyptians for 400 years, and it was God's time to deliver them out of bondage. And so God rained down the plagues on the Egyptians until Pharaoh would let his people go. There were 10 plagues. The last plague was the plague of the death angel, and God had said that any family that does not uh, have uh, the blood of a male lamb on their doorposts, on the top and on the sides, that if you don't have that, all the firstborn in that house will die. And you remember how God had prescribed that the children of Israel take an innocent male lamb, blameless lamb, shed the blood of that animal, uh, put the blood on the door, and then they would have a Passover meal inside. And you remember the Bible says on that night, the death angel passed over all of the houses that were protected by the blood of that lamb. And then from then on out, this Passover meal was something that the Israelites They would observe yearly, and they would remember back to this great time of deliverance in their history when God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt through the blood of a lamb. Now, here is Jesus in the Last Supper. He's meeting with his disciples in the upper room. They are observing the Passover meal, and what Jesus does is he transforms that Passover meal to a new, a new meal, we could say, a new supper. He took that ancient feast and he transformed it into what we now know as the Lord's Supper. And so therefore, as Christians, we don't, uh, we don't practice the Passover with a Passover meal. We have the Lord's Supper because that reminds us that Calvary superseded the Exodus as the greatest redemptive event in history. And that Passover lamb pointed to Jesus Christ, who would be the lamb of God, who would shed his blood that we might be delivered from death and that we might be redeemed. And so at the Lord's Supper then, Jesus instituted this this sacred meal, this memorial feast. And this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, uh, verse number 22. He said this, and as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank it. And he said, unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you. Verily I say unto you, I will not drink no more of the, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus told his disciples right there, I'm not going to drink any more Um, fruit of the vine until we're together again one day in the kingdom having supper. From that day until this, Jesus has been on a fast with regard to drinking that, and he won't drink it again until we're together. But it was the desire of Christ. And what I read here in Mark, we also see it in Matthew, we see it in Luke, we see it in John. And Paul mentions it here in 1 Corinthians 11, the passage that we just read. This, This is the desire of Christ. Jesus wants us to meet together and to have this supper. But here's the second thing, another reason, it follows the pattern of the early church. The Lord's Supper then became a normal function of the early church. And we read this in the book of Acts, where that they were continually giving themselves to the apostles' doctrine, that's the teaching of the word, fellowship, they were fellowshipping together, breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper. They continued in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So there were four activities that they constantly did. Teaching of the word of God, fellowshipping together, observing the Lord's Supper, and prayer. That's why we do those things here. 
That all started back in the early church. And there were many terms that were used to describe the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. It's called the breaking of bread as we see, or we read here. It's called the, uh, the Lord's Table. Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. The meal of the Lord's Supper is another phrase. And in these terms, Paul is reminding us that it is the Lord who presides over this meal when we partake of it. But also another word that's used that we hear sometimes is Eucharist. And that is from the Greek word, give thanks, because the Bible says in Mark where Jesus said that he took bread and he gave thanks. The Greek word is Eucharistio. And from that, people have called this the Eucharist, which simply means giving thanks. But the record of church history tells us that the early church Observe this every week, every Sunday. There is a document called the uh, Didache that was written about AD 120 that said that the Christians, come, quote, come together the Lord's day for the Lord and, and the breaking of bread and giving of thanks. So they did this every time they met together. Justin Martyr speaks of the Christians meeting on Sunday and partaking in communion. So this was the pattern of the early church. This is something they constantly did. But here's a, here's a third thing, number three. Another reason we do it is because it proclaims the gospel in visual form. Look at, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 26, where Paul's writing about it, and he says, For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Notice where it says show, uh, to make known. It's kind of in a visual way. You're visualizing the gospel there, the Church Father Augustine called the Lord's Supper a kind of a visual word. So not only do you come to church and you hear the gospel being preached with your ears, whenever we come together for the Lord's Supper, we kind of see the gospel visually. We see this in the bread. We see the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the grape juice, we see the, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so and there's a sense in which we are seeing the gospel uh, before us and, and there's a sense in which when we do this, we kind of go back in our mind and we remember the cross of Christ. There's an interesting verse in Galatians, in Galatians 3.1, where Paul said this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? That's interesting. Was, was Jesus crucified among the Galatians? I thought Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Paul said, he was crucified, he was evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now, the people in Galatia were not there in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. So what did Paul mean when he said that? Well, the word evidently set forth, that's the Greek word, which has the idea of kind of painting a portrait or a picture. You know, we would use uh, the equivalent word today was it would be like a billboard sign. It's been placed in front of you. A picture, a descriptive picture has been put in front of you. Now, what did Paul mean by that? He, he could, it could be that he was talking about his preaching. Paul preached Christ so clearly. He preached the cross so clearly that it was as if they could see it right in front of them in a beautiful picture, the cross of Christ being portrayed. Or perhaps, there's no way to know this, I often wonder, was he including in this the idea of the Lord's Supper? Because every time we take the Lord's Supper, there's a sense in which we see Jesus Christ in front of us crucified. We see what took place at the cross. Not that we, Jesus could ever be crucified again. No, God forbid. That could only happen one time. That was a once-for-all moment in history. But Jesus wants us to remember it. He wants us to remember what took place on the cross. And there's a sense in which when we come to the Lord's table and we partake of these elements. These are signs, these are symbols that remind us of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and what took place on the cross. But here's the fourth reason why I think it's so very important. Number four, it provides a means of grace for the believer through the spiritual presence of Christ. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Now, there are four views about the Lord's Supper. There's one view called transubstantiation. This is the Catholic view. This is the view that the bread and the wine become the body and the blood of Christ. And this is a view that developed all the way back in the first century. 
uh, this view that they saw the body and the blood as present in a physical manner in the Lord's table. As early as the second century, we find Justin Martyr talking about the corporal presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so the Catholic Church began to teach that it's a kind of a sacramental mystery took place. And this is what they teach even today. They teach that when the priest blesses these elements, that the bread becomes, it, is, it, is, it transforms into the body of Christ, and the, the grape juice transforms into the blood of Christ. That's why it's called transubstantiation. They say that when the priest gives that priestly blessing, that this happens. Now, they say that the outward look of the bread and the wine doesn't change. Really, okay? The outward form of it doesn't change, but the substance of it changes. And they say, that's a mystery. You're telling me that's a huge mystery. You're telling me that when the priest prays, even though the outward appearance of it doesn't change, the substance of it changes. So literally, you are taking in the body of Christ, literally, and you're taking in the blood of Christ, literally. It transforms into those elements, which creates a whole bunch of problems. That's not what the Bible teaches. That was never intended. And also, you have to remember that Roman Catholicism teaches that there's some kind of a saving element in the Lord's Supper when there's not. That was never intended for that purpose. But nevertheless, that's what they teach. And by the way, in a lot of Catholic services today, they don't even bother passing around uh, wine because it, it became too sacred. They're afraid people can't handle it. If it literally becomes the blood of Christ, they don't want anybody spilling it. So really, all you get when you go to a service like that in a Catholic church is you get a little bit of bread and that's it because the wine is too sacred. That's what it has devolved to. And then there's, a, obviously that view is not biblical. We, that there's no biblical justification for that anywhere in Scripture. But then there's a second view. It's called consubstantiation. And this is the idea that Christ is physically present in the elements in some way. Um, and this was the view that was taught by Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the Catholic priest who found justification by faith when he studied Romans, and he pulled out of the Catholic Church and really sparked the Reformation and the Protestant Reformation. But one thing that didn't really change is this idea of the Lord's Supper. He was, you kind of get the sense when you hear him talk about it, or read, when I read about him, I didn't actually hear him, I'm not that old, but read about what he said about it that he was unwilling to kind of let that transubstantiation thing go. So he says, well, the elements don't literally change to the, uh, the body and the blood of Christ. Still, some way, Christ is mystically present in the elements. And that's where you get the word consubstantiation, meaning with. He's, the, he's with the substance there. He's with the elements there. In fact, there was a big debate between him and a man by the name of Zwingli, where Zwingli taught the memorial view and Luther didn't want to give up the fact that Christ was somehow present in the elements. And when they asked him to explain that, um, he basically uh, argued that, that there was a transference of the divine nature into Christ's human nature at the incarnation. And then hence, the physical presence of Christ could be everywhere, this is what he said. Therefore, he could be physically present in body and blood simultaneously wherever the sacrament was cel celebrated. That was kind of an ingenious way of trying to explain his position, the, the problem is it's just simply not true. How could the human nature of Christ be everywhere and yet be fully human? This was a serious doctrinal error on the part of Luther. And so that view is nowhere taught in Scripture. Then there's a third view, and that is the memorialism view. This is the idea that this is just simply a remembrance supper, and that's all. Uh, Christ is, is absent and so there, I think there's a sense in which the pendulum swings all the way the other way. You have here on this one side people trying to say that Christ is somehow mystically in the elements, and that's not true. But then the pendulum swings all the way to the other way and says, well, it's a memorial supper, and that's it. Christ is not present. It's purely symbolic. And this was a position held by Zwingli, one of the reformers, and it's a position that has been held by many, many fundamental and evangelical churches in those circles. And so um, this view says that the Lord's Supper is not a channel of grace in any way. It's just simply a time to remember the Lord Jesus. Now, the, 
Now, obviously, this is a remembrance feast. We know that because Jesus said that. He said, this do in what? Remembrance of me. You do this to remember me. So we know that's beyond question, that every time we do this, we remember the Lord Jesus. So it is a memorial supper. The problem I have with this position is not in what it affirms. I agree with all of that. The problem I have is in what it denies. I think it just goes overboard to deny the presence of Christ. It seems bizarre to me to say that Christ is everywhere present. He's present in his church in prayer and other things, but it, not with respect to the Lord's Supper. So let me give you a fourth view here. And I think that uh, this is the right approach, and that is what I call the communion view, or to say that Christ is spiritually with us when we're here. And we're, we're partaking of these elements in a very wonderful way, in a very beautiful spiritual way, we have fellowship with Jesus Christ at his table. There's a sense in which we are refreshed spiritually when we remember the Lord Jesus here. Uh, In no way do these elements contain Christ. None of that is true. It is a remembrance feast. But there's a sense in which there's a special fellowship that happens between Christ and the believer when we come to this table in the right frame of mind, in the right manner, we fellowship with Jesus in a very special, intimate way spiritually. That's the idea there. There's a beautiful fellowship. I'm reminded of the oneness that I have with Christ. Remember, we are one with him. Remember, that's called the mystical union of the believer. I'm one with Jesus. He's one with me. I'm reminded of that oneness that I have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit uses this time to increase my faith, remind me of that position I have in Christ, strengthens me, refreshes me, confirms my faith. And so there's a sense in which that's the way in which grace is imparted to me, not in a saving way, but in a sanctifying way. I kind of liken it to prayer. When we get on our knees and we pray and we unload our burdens to the Lord and we have fellowship with the Lord in prayer, are we different when we get off our knees? Has there been a sense in which grace has strengthened us at that moment and we're different in the way we got on our knees? Well, there's a sense in which that also happens at the Lord's Supper. We're strengthened, we're refreshed, we're renewed, we're revived spiritually. We are infused with strength from the grace of Almighty God. We're blessed in that sense. And let me tell you, uh, and there's many verses I can go to, um, but just for lack of time, let me just show you one reason why I hold this view. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me just, just back up to chapter 10. And Paul is arguing here about fleeing from idolatry. He's given some instructions to the believers about this. But now let me, again, give you the context. Earlier on, Paul was dealing with them about a questionable practice And um, should believers go to the meat market and buy meat that was sacrificed to idols? That was a question that the Corinthians had asked Paul. Look in chapter 8, look in verse 1, go back a little bit farther. Look in chapter 8, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered on the idols, we know that we have knowledge, that we have all knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. Look at verse 2. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But look at, drop down to verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there's no other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there's one God and Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So Paul says, look, In this idea of buying meat in the marketplace, the agora, this meat that was sacrificed to idols, you say, why would Christians do that? Well, because it was lower, it was lower in price, and and they could get more meat at a lower price. But the only problem is it was sacrificed to an idol in a pagan ceremony, and a Christian would go to the meat market and they would buy that, and some other believers would see that and say, they shouldn't do that. And so the question was, is it right or is it wrong? And Paul writes and says, look, you have the liberty to do it. We know that there's really only one God and that these idols represent gods that really aren't real. There's really only one God. We know that. So a believer has the liberty to do this. It's okay to do that, but you might want to consider that you don't use your liberty to cause another believer to stumble. 
So if, if you buying that meat in the marketplace causes another believer to stumble, then don't do it. Look in chapter 8, look in verse 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. I never want to do anything that would cause another believer to stumble. So therefore, uh, if, if it offends someone else, I'm not going to do it. So it was a questionable practice that Paul says, be careful how you exercise your liberty on this. But what was not questionable was going to a pagan temple and eating meat in that temple. That was not questionable. That was wrong. In fact, Paul said, that's idolatry. And you need to flee from idolatry. He makes a clear distinction between buying the meat in a marketplace and taking it home and fixing it and going into a temple and eating it there. That was beyond question wrong. So look in chapter 10 and look at verse number 14 where he says, Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Run from that. Don't do that. You run from it. It's a command. You flee from that. That's never to be something that you do. And what was the argument that Paul uses to tell them, don't ever do that? He uses the argument about the Lord's Supper. Look at verse number 15. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. You use your discernment and listen to what I say here, Paul says. Look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. And so what's Paul saying here? Paul is using the Lord's Supper as an example um, of why they shouldn't do it. And Paul points to the Lord's Supper as the reason. And here's the connection. When we come to the Lord's table and we partake here at the Lord's table, we are fellowshipping with Christ in a very real spiritual way. There's an intimacy that takes place there. There's a spiritual thing that happens. It's very sacred. It's very sanctifying. And here's the connection that, look, there's something that happens spiritually. And don't you know the reverse is true? If you go to a pagan temple and you partake in the meal there and you eat meat sacrificed to an idol there, there's a detrimental spiritual thing that takes place there. You're fellowshipping with demons. Look down at verse number 20. But I say the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So you see the connection there? Paul said there's something real that takes place there spiritually. There's a beautiful intimacy that when you come to the Lord's table, you are fellowshipping with Jesus. It is a wonderful spiritual event of closeness and fellowship with Christ. And then he likens that to when a believer would go in that day into a pagan temple and eat meat. He's saying you are fellowshipping with demons. Even though the idols represent gods that don't exist, there are demons behind all of that, and you're fellowshipping with the demons. So that's the connection there. And so the, un, the idea that I want you to get, however, is that Paul is clearly expressing this thought that you are fellowshipping with the Son of God in a very real way when you come to the Lord's table. And that's why I say Christ is spiritually present. There's a wonderful spiritual fellowship that we have with Jesus. But let me give you the fifth thing here about the Lord's table. It forces believers to examine themselves spiritually. And this is what God calls upon believers to do at the Lord's table. Look in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever eat shall eat of this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. The Corinthians were partaking of communion in a very unworthy way. What they would do is they would have like a, what they called an agape feast. They would have people would bring food. And if you were poor back then, you didn't really get a chance to eat meat a lot. And probably the only chance you got to eat it when you came together in the church and some rich people would bring their meat and they would just bring all the food together and everyone would just eat. You know, we call today potluck, you know, 
which I don't like the word luck. We should call it pot faith, you know. But everyone brings their food. They put it all together, and we all eat, and we have fellowship. When well, they were doing that in the early church, it was called an agape feast. The problem was is that at the church of Corinth, they became so divided that the rich people would take their food and put it on one side and say only certain people can eat this. It was horrible. And the thing that should have united the church together was actually causing division. And then at the end of this love feast, they would always have the Lord's Supper. And by that time, some of the believers had had a little bit too much wine. They had, they had, they had practiced sectionalism, division, and then they were pretending to come together and take the Lord's Supper. That's why Paul said, I don't praise you in this. You, you come together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. You, you can leave church in a worse condition than when you came. And this was happening here at the church at Corinth. Paul said, I don't praise you in this. Paul said, you, you have failed to understand the, significant, the significance of what's going on here at the Lord's Supper. When you come to this table, you better come in a worthy manner. You better examine yourself. You better make sure that your heart is right. So every time we come to the Lord's table, we should examine ourselves spiritually. That's what Paul calls upon us to do here. And he said in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. When we judge ourselves by examining ourselves and confessing our sins before the Lord and asking for forgiveness, God doesn't have to step in and judge us when we're judging ourselves. So when we come to the Lord's table, we need to, we need to do that very sincerely. And, I, and I, again, there's so much more I could say, but let me just give you four looks that we should take when we do the Lord's Supper. Four looks. First of all, we look back. We look back with gratitude to Jesus at his death on the cross. We remember Christ. We look around. We look around at the body of believers with whom we share this supper. It is something that we do together corporately. That's why Paul emphasizes in chapter 11, when you come together, when you come together. It's not something you do individually. It's something that the church should do together. We look around and we see these other believers and we love these other believers around us and we understand that we are all one in Christ. There's a beautiful oneness that we have. Then we look up, we look to heaven, where the risen, ascended Christ intercedes for us as our high priest. And we look forward, we look forward to the day when Jesus will return. This anticipates when the Lord comes. Look again at verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he what? Come. And we're looking forward because we know that Jesus is going to come and we're going to celebrate another meal with him together. And he anticipates that. He longs for that. And we should long for that. We should look forward to that as well. So this is why this needs to be a regular godly discipline in our own heart. And we need to be careful that when we come to the Lord's table, we come in a worthy way. Let's bow for prayer together. Ask our men to get in position as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Father, thank you for this beautiful ordinance that you've given to us, a time when we remember our Savior, a time when we examine our own heart, a time when we can have fellowship in a very real spiritual way with our Savior. So, Father, may you bless us as we partake of these elements together. May we be reminded of Calvary. May we go to the cross, as it were, by faith. May Christ be evidently crucified among us as we see Jesus, our Redeemer, dying for our sins. Bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.